Um, kindly take your seats. Before we start the program, may I request everybody to put their mobile phones on silent mode. It is an immense pleasure for me to welcome everyone to the second T.N. Chaturvedi Memorial Lecture, for which we have the pleasure of having with us Mr. N.R. Narayan Murthy, the co-founder of Infosys, an iconic business leader who was instrumental in forging India's growth momentum in information and technology sector. Mr. Murthy, an electrical engineer, got his master's degree from IIT Kanpur. He declined a lucrative job offer to take up a challenging assignment as chief systems programmer for a few years in the computer center of IIM Ahmedabad that had got India's first time-sharing computing system under the aegis of Professor J. Krishnaya. After experimenting with different jobs, he co-founded Infosys in 1981, and the rest, as we say, is history. He oversaw its dramatic rise over the next three decades. He was awarded the Padma Shri in 2000 and the Padma Vibhushan in 2008. So I extend a very warm welcome to Sri Narayan Murthy. I also extend a very warm welcome to Vice Chairman of Prime Minister's Museum and Library Executive Council, Dr. A. Surya Prakash, who has very kindly consented to chair the program. I also welcome and of course also thank uh, our respected director, Sri Sanjeev Nandan Sahayaji, ex-Power Secretary, who has of course uh, guided us all through this program. And then I extend a very warm welcome to the family members of late Shri T.N. Chaturvedi. And of course, in some extended way, I can also be counted as a family member of late Shri Chaturvedi. So we have here two sons of Shri Chaturvedi. Uh, the elder one, Avnindranath Chaturvedi ji, he has come all the way from the US where he has been for last 25, 30 years, he's there. And uh, then we have the youngest uh, child and the younger son, Atulindranath Chaturvedi, who has been working over time uh, for this program. And uh, we also have uh, uh, Mr. Chaturvedi's daughter, Anuradha ji here, she is sitting here. So I extend a very warm welcome to them also. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, I extend a very warm welcome to all those who have taken time and the trouble in this uh, very cold winter to uh, attend this program. I welcome everyone. Uh, I would like to give a brief introduction of uh, Sri T.N. Chaturvedi. He was born in 1928. He held many important administrative positions and constitutional offices in the government and political system of independent India over 70 years. He can fittingly be described as one of the key institution builders among a large number of India after independence. He was associated with numerous academic, literary, and philanthropic institutions as a member and in various leadership capacities. He was born in, uh, in a small place called Tirva in central Uttar Pradesh, district Kannauj. He obtained an MA LLB degree from Allahabad University, winning the university gold medal for economics and political science. 
He joined the first batch of Indian administrative service in 1950. And he had told us in one of uh, his lectures here how he was, uh, this first batch was scheduled to meet uh, the great Sardar Vallabhai Patel in December only when they were doing their training. But on 15th of December, uh, Sardar Patel passed away and therefore that meeting could not take place because as the key institution builder of India after independence, Sardar Patel was very keen on meeting this first batch of IAS after independence. Uh, but that's how it happened eventually. He joined the first batch of IAS in 1950, was attached to Rajasthan cadre, serving the state in capacities such as private secretary to the chief minister, collector and district magistrate of Ajmer, and secretary in the departments of industries, mines, town planning and tourism. As a fellow of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, IBRD, which is a part of the World Bank organization, he studied in the US in the 1950s after joining service, and later he was chief secretary in Delhi administration between 1971 and 1973, chief commissioner during the emergency. He was appointed Union Education Secretary in the Ministry of Education in 1982. And this was the time when this ministry included the ministries which later became separate ministries, that is the ministries of sports, women and child welfare, culture and education. And then he became Union Home Secretary uh, in 1982. After that, he was appointed to the very important constitutional position of the Comptroller and Auditor General of India. Uh, he served in that position between 1984 and 1990. On demitting office, he started his political career by joining the BJP in 1991 and was twice elected to the Rajya Sabha. Now, Mr. Chaturvedi was also appointed the governor of Karnataka in August 2002, and he served in that position for five years with distinction. And briefly, he was also the governor of the state of Kerala. Uh, as governor, he won the trust and respect of all political parties and the public in the state, and was often described as one of the best governors that Karnataka had seen. I must mention here that Shri Chaturvedi had a very long association with this institution of about 40 years. He was the vice president of Prime Minister's Museum and Library Society. It was called NMML then. And then also the chairman of its executive council. In his distinguished career, he received many awards. The highest of them, of course, was Padma Vibhushan, which he received in 1991. Among other rewards, awards were the Magasese plaque for distinguished contributions to public service and public audit. And the first DAV award for lifetime achievement in 2017. He also received a number of honorary PhDs. Late Sri Chaturvedi led a very active retired life. At the time of his demise in January 2020, on 5th January 2020, he was the chairman of Indian Institute of Public Administration, and I think he was its chairman for at least two decades, if I remember correctly. He was the chairman of Hindi Bhavan, Chairman Institute for Studies in Industrial Development, that is ISID, Chairman of Lala Divan Chand Trust, Vice Chairman Rajend Prasad Bhavan Trust. He was also Vice President, DAV Managing Committee, and the Chairman of PGDAV College, Delhi. He was editor of Hindi Monthly Sahitya Amrit from 2007, which I used to read with great interest. Whenever I met him, he would give me copies, even the back issues. It was a delight to read them. And he was a member, member of the governing body of Janki Devi Memorial College, Delhi. At the time of his demise, he was also the chairman of the finance committee of the Prime Minister's Museum and Library. Shri Chaturvedi was a lifelong lover of books. He amassed a 
vast collection of books in Hindi and English, and keeping in mind his long association with this institution and his deep attachment. In fact, even in the last years of his life, he would make it a point to visit this institution once in a while, go through the racks, you know, and find out books which he was interested in. And of course, he inspired all of us uh, by this. So uh, these books, which are actually a library in their own right, they have been donated by his family to this institution, and they are now here uh, in the library. They are uh, being used by the scholars. So we thank the family of Mr. T. N. Chaturvedi for uh, donating these books. This has allowed us, of course, to uh, keep the memory of Mr. T. N. Chaturvedi here, but some of these books are quite rare, and certainly they are very useful for generations of his scholars. Um, Mr. Chaturvedi, you know, he was always smiling and was, uh, he always had a kind word for everyone. He was known for his sterling qualities of head and heart. It was his legendary probity in personal and public life that led the distinguished jurist Fali Nariman to describe him in a lecture in 1990. And he knew, Fali Nariman knew that Mr. Chaturvedi was there in the audience so then Mr. Nariman described him as one of the finest civil servants that independent India had seen. So with these words, I once again welcome everyone and I welcome Mr. N.R. Narayan Murthy. And I must say at the end that the topic of uh, today's lecture, second uh, T.N. Chaturvedi Memorial Lecture, Entrepreneurship, Ethics and Good Governance in Creating a More Prosperous India, Lessons of a Practitioner, Nobody could have been more suitable than Mr. N Mr. Narayan Murthy for delivering a lecture on this topic. So now, without further delay, I would like to invite Mr. Murthy to deliver his lecture. Respected uh, people on the dais and respected audience. It is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to speak at this memorial lecture. Late uh, Triloknath Chaturvedi was a distinguished member of the Indian Administrative Services, a bureaucrat much respected for his competence, honesty, efficiency, and effectiveness, an intellectual, a patriot, and a much loved and much respected governor of Karnataka between 2002 and 2007. My wife and I had the privilege of knowing him when he was the governor of Karnataka. He was kind enough to visit the Bangalore and Mysore campuses of Infosys. I had many conversations with him on how our country can achieve accelerated economic progress. This issue was always a big concern for him. I learned much from him in this important subject. Therefore, I will speak today on some ideas he had discussed with me to make our country economically stronger, and the role of our entrepreneurs and our government in achieving that ambition. Data tells us that about 3.4 billion people in the world 
which is approximately about 40 to 43% of the global population, still struggle to meet their basic needs. About 800 million people in the world go to bed on an empty stomach every night. More than a billion and a half people do not have clean water to drink. According to the World Inequality Report, the share in the national income of the bottom 50% of our population was a mere 13% as late as 2021. According to the National Health Survey data, the average life expectancy of a Dalit woman was just 39.5 years, while that of an upper caste woman was just 54.1 years. Only 54.6% of the scheduled caste women, 47.9% of the scheduled tribe women, 57.2% of the OBC women, and 70.3% of the upper caste women received antenatal care in the presence of a qualified doctor in our country. These are very worrying signals for every one of us. Despite the unrelenting hard work of Sri Modiji's government and previous governments, India is still ranked a lowly 132 out of 191 nations in the ranking of nations by Human Development Index. Alleviating or eliminating poverty is about ensuring that every citizen leads a life with sufficient resources for an acceptable quality of life, dignity, and confidence. Mrs. Indira Gandhi used the slogan, Garibi Hatavo, more than 50 years ago to publicly commit our country to becoming rid of poverty. I salute the successive Indian governments that have worked hard to reduce poverty experienced by 70% of Indian population when the British left India in 1947. But the poverty has still persisted. The well-intentioned and the hard-working leaders of various political parties in power in our country since independence, both at the center and in the states have spent huge resources on various subsidies to reduce stark poverty in India. The political leaders of the developed nations have believed that providing foreign aid to developing countries is an important and a compassionate way of reducing poverty in the developing world. Unfortunately, data tells us that neither of these well-intentioned, compassionate, and noble ideas, that is subsidies and foreign aid, seems to have been as much of a success as the world would have liked. I appreciate and applaud the hard work of our politicians and our bureaucrats in attempting to remove poverty. I am neither heartless nor without conscience to say 
that subsidies are not needed and that subsidies do not help the poor people. However, as one raised by my parents to respect scholarship, I do want to learn from the experts on how our nation can become, can make these subsidies to become even more beneficial to our poor people. I'm happy that Prime Minister Modiji's government has decided to use the Aadhaar identity mechanism to ensure the correct identity of the beneficiaries of the MNREGA scheme. This is a good example of using technology to reduce leakage in dispersing subsidies and aid. I will spend the next few minutes on what the experts say about making subsidies and grants useful for poor people and creating enduring prosperity. The story of low success of charity, subsidy, and foreign aid is the same throughout the developing world, but for some notable exceptions in East Asia, in Southeast Asia, and China. Let me take an example and illustrate my point from the insightful book, The White Man's Burden, why the West's efforts to aid the rest have done so much ill and so little good by Professor William E. Sterling. According to him, the developed world has spent about $2.3 trillion in the last five decades in foreign aid and has still not managed to prevent even half of all malaria deaths in the developing world. Even after these long years, they have still not managed to deliver bed nets that cost just $4 to all the needy people in South Asia, right here, and in Africa. Those of us from Bangalore city know the mosquito menace very well, even today. After 77 years of hard work by successive state governments in Karnataka. On the other hand, on a single day in 2005, six million children in the developed world received their own copies of the latest Harry Potter book shipped to them on the promised day by Amazon and by Barnes and Noble. Folks, this is an important question that the intellectuals of the world should seek answer to. Two different answers to this vexing question have been given by Professor William Easterly and Professor Clayton Christensen. That is, why in spite of so much of money having been spent by the donor countries, the developed world has not been able to solve its problems. Now, both these answers are very useful. Professor, uh, sorry, Professor William Easterly says, I quote him, in foreign aid planners, the traditional aid givers announce good intentions but do not motivate anyone in the supply chain to carry them out properly. That is here in India, in Africa, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, you know, you name it, all these countries. That's why poor, why poor dying children in the developing world do not get 12 cent medicines while healthy, rich 
children in the developed world get Harry Potter's books on the appointed day. The planners do not have enough data about how many children in each locale have malaria and how many doses of medicine are needed at each of the myriad clinics. They do not have ground level agents motivated to get those doses there. The health workers in the local clinics are poorly paid and poorly motivated. Nobody knows who or what to blame if the 12 cent medicines are out of stock. Worse, the local parents in the developing countries do not even have a working mechanism to communicate this problem to the planners. On the other hand, the searchers, who are the agents of the alternative approach, find things that work at the ground level in the developing world, motivate local people, and obtain success. Let me talk about a heartwarming example of fighting malaria in Malawi in Africa from Professor Easterly's book. This powerful example is about the success of Population Services International, or PSI, a Washington-based NGO. PSI obtained initial funding and support from official aid agencies to sell bed nets for just 50 cents uh, through antenatal clinics in Malawi, to pregnant mothers and children under five, the main target group for malaria. They created an incentive for nurses who distribute these nets by giving them nine cents per net to keep for themselves. The result was that the nets were always in stock and in good condition. PSI also sold these nets to rich Malawians through private sector channels for $5 a net. The profit from these sales were used for distributing subsidized nets sold at the clinics and the program paid for itself. The result has been increased use of bed nets for children in Malawi from a mere 8% in the year 2000 to as much as 55% in 2004. I do not have the latest data, but I can tell you it's somewhere near 100%. What is interesting about this experiment is that PSI headquarters was not the one that was prescribing this solution. It was the deep thinking, uh, ground level, and committed Malavian, Malavian bureaucrats and leaders at the local office in Malawi who designed this solution. Another way of looking at this example is to borrow the words of Adam Smith and say that it is fair to say that it was not the benevolence of Malawian nurses that provide, provided bed nets to the needy, but the self-interest of those nurses. There is one idea of Professor Easterly that we must all agree with, without argument. And that is his suggestion of enabling ground level leaders in the developing world to deliver the best out of these subsidies as shown by the Malawi example. Let me give you a couple of examples right from my own suburb in Bangalore that buttresses Professor Easterly's thesis. A respected Indian corporation offered a grant 
to expand the number of beds by 50% in a government hospital specializing in cardiovascular surgery in Bangalore. It was a government hospital, mind you. And they were specializing in, they specialized in cardiovascular surgery. The head of the hospital, Dr. C. N. Manjuna, is a deep thinking, visionary, altruistic, committed, and hardworking leader who leads by example. He ensured that the project was fully owned by him and his colleagues. He was very details oriented and honest in getting the best value for money for every paisa spent from the ground. He worked enthusiastically with the architect and the contractor to get the best hospital design by spending time outside his hospital duty hours and outside his surgeries. He completed the construction of this uh, extension in record time, part of which was during the COVID time. This is recently. He built a first-rate hospital annex with 350 beds, including 70 ICU beds, three cath labs, and four operation theaters. This new unit of the hospital, which I visited just a couple of weeks ago, uh, has been serving 380 outpatients, performing 25 cath lab procedures, and four open heart surgeries every day for patients from all over the country, not just Bangalore, all over the country. I have been told by people on the ground in my own suburb that just an hour by bus from that place, another government hospital was provided a similar grant by the same corporation. Unfortunately, there was no visionary, committed, and details-oriented leader to take full ownership of that project, the second project. Consequently, I am also told that the expansion project for the second government hospital is still not complete. I believe that there is no electricity available for this extension as, I'm, as of uh, just now, today. The project has been caught in bureaucratic delays with no one taking responsibility for any outcome. I sincerely hope that I have been conveyed the wrong data on the second hospital. The only difference between these two government hospitals, not one private hospital, one government hospital, these two government hospitals in and around the same city of Bangalore is the bottom line responsibility and the ownership taken by the deep thinking, well-intentioned, visionary, motivated, and action-oriented leadership at the ground level in the first project and a total lack of it in the second project. A good lesson from Professor Easterly for our country is to ensure that such aid and subsidy are managed properly by competent, motivated, well-intentioned, well-trained, incentivized, incentivized ground-level leaders who take bottom line responsibility and accountability for the success of such aid and subsidy projects. The experts believe that it is also necessary to ensure that subsidies and aid from the state governments, the federal government, corporations, and the multilateral institutions enable our poor people to become self-sufficient in a reasonable period. They further believe that subsidy projects should also, where possible, 
imparts skills that become valuable for poor young people to obtain enduring jobs for the rest of their lives. They also agree that it is necessary for the governments to provide the poor with food, clothing, and other subsidies until the poor young people obtain skills that will provide them enduring and permanent jobs uh, in the competitive world outside. They add that the focus should be on making the people receiving the subsidies learn skills in some function to obtain jobs and become wage earners. They also tell me that this is a tough cultural issue. Uh, <laughs> their suggestion is to establish training schools for these ground level leaders so that they succeed in the task of helping the beneficiaries get the best out of subsidies and aid. I have just described the value of visionary leadership, bottom line responsibility, hard work, motivation, incentivization, concern for the less fortunate ones, entrepreneurial spirit, and the power of innovation demonstrated by the ground level leader and his staff for the success of the grant in the first project that I described, or lack of it in the second project in converting non-consumer heart patients to consumer heart patients, according to the much revered innovation guru, Professor Clayton Christensen. He and his colleagues have demonstrated the power of innovation by entrepreneurs in a free market environment in their seminal book, The Prosperity Paradox, How Innovation Can Lift Nations Out of Poverty. The bureaucrats and the political leaders of a developing country may want to read this book. When you combine aspiration, innovation, incentive, passion, and hard work of entrepreneurs with the affordable price for a product or a service as we just now saw in Malawi, you convert non-consumers to consumers. In Malawi's case, it is people who are not buying those bed nets to people who bought those bed nets, all for 50 cents. The price was right and the benefit was clear. This is how entrepreneurs use innovation in a free market to create jobs for citizens, create wealth for themselves and their investors, and contribute taxes to the nation. According to Professor Clayton Christensen, this is the cycle of moving a nation towards prosperity. Prosperity instills confidence in citizens to compound discretionary wealth, resulting in socio-economic progress. It helps people raise their own aspirations and an improved standard of living. The most important metric in measuring the prosperity or well-being of a society or a nation is access to gainful employment and upward social mobility. By this definition, prosperity is the process by which more and more people in a region improve their economic and social well-being. The traditional approach of aid and charity to fix poverty, as Professor Easterly points out, can create despondency and dependency rather than foster sustainable economic development and enduring prosperity. It is good to remember the words of John Rockefeller that charity is injurious unless it helps the recipient to become independent of it. 
market-driven innovations or a more effective way to address poverty. Prosperity results from enduring economic development and wealth creation for sustained and long periods. True prosperity comes from creating conditions that allow for widespread and accelerated economic growth and the emergence of new industries and new markets. Let us remember the words of Henry Ford who said, the only prosperity that people can afford to be satisfied with is the kind that is permanent, that lasts. Prosperity is not just about increasing income of individuals for short periods. Professor Christensen says, I quote him, consider this, since, these are his words, not my words, since 1960, the world has spent more than $4.3 trillion in uh, uh, development assistance trying to help poorer countries. In fact, many of the poorest countries in 1960 are still poor today. And even worse, at least 20 countries were poorer in 2015 than they were in 1960, that is 55 years after receiving development assistance, which, is, which was billions of dollars of worth of aid. His thesis, substantiated by several powerful examples from around the world, is that the only way nations can usher in poverty, prosperity is by creating an environment where communities and nations can thrive economically through innovation and entrepreneurship. Of course, you all know the well-known saying, feed a man a fish to rid him of hunger for a day or teach, teach him fishing to rid him of hunger forever. Professor Christensen also points out how innovation can create cultural change. He says, and I quote him, these are his words, the third and perhaps the most important output of a market is the cultural change of new market triggers and reinforces. In addition to democratizing products and services so that many more people in society have access market-creating innovations also democratize the benefits of, succe of successful new markets that are created. These benefits are not limited to just jobs, but also to ownership opportunities that are often offered to investors and employees. When many people in a, reg in a region understand that they can begin to solve many of their problems, then that is by participating in the new market as investors, producers, or consumers, they are more likely to change the way they think about their own societies. This is one of the ways new markets begin to change a society's culture which can make all the difference for a country looking to prosper, unquote. Now let us get to what all these data and facts mean for India, our country. Late Lee Kuan Yew, the former prime minister of Singapore once said, and I quote him, a nation is not great just by its size alone. It is the will, the cohesion, the stamina, the discipline of its people and the quality of their leaders which ensures it an honorable place in history." Unquote. I am happy that Prime Minister Modi has identified two causal factors for the success of entrepreneurship and innovation. The result is the creation of two of his major initiatives, Startup India, and NEP or the National Education Policy. Both are extremely valuable. Startup India 
is likely to yield positive results in the medium term. NEP will lay a strong foundation to make India an innovative and prosperous nation in the long term. The result of the encouragement for startup India in urban India is available right in my own suburb, Jainagar, Bangalore, with so many new medical shops, restaurants, roadside vegetable and fruit vendors, grocery shops, shops selling clothes, barber shops, and fitness centers doing flourishing business. I do not have data for rural India. My hope is that that too should have picked up well. This means jobs are being created. There is increase in disposable income. Non-consumers are getting converted to consumers and the economy is progressing. I feel so nice about this trend. Entrepreneurs are dreamers and visionaries. According to Professor Clayton Christensen, entrepreneurs create huge markets, jobs, ecosystem, and prosperity for the nation by converting non-consumers to consumers, by offer offering sufficient value from a product or a service at a price that is attractive for the non-consumers to become consumers. This is very important. I want every one of you to understand. Late Robert Kennedy borrowed the words of George Bernard Shaw and said, I quote him, most people see things as they are and wonder why. I dream of things that never are and then say, why not? I believe his words describe an entrepreneur very aptly. There must be unanimity of conviction amongst all the political parties, whether in government or in opposition, and whether at the center or in the state, on three fundamental issues. First, the only way India can create prosperity for our people is by creating more and more jobs with higher and higher disposable income through the private sector. Second, this task is achievable only by entrepreneurs in the private sector, leveraging the power of innovation in a free market with a fair and transparent regulator. And third and most importantly, that creating enabling conditions and removing every obstacle to the success of these hardworking entrepreneurs quickly and rapidly is the most important responsibility of every government, not just in our nation, India, but in the entire developing world. Let me speak a little bit about the second causal factor, that is innovation. NEP committee, headed by the much respected Dr. Kasturi Rangan, with highly accomplished members like Professor Manjul Bhargav, a Fields Medal winner, aims to improve the quality of our primary, secondary, and higher educational institutions to teach independent, critical, and analytical thinking, Socratic questioning, relating theory taught in the class to the real world phenomena around us, to unravel the mysteries of nature and to solve our real world problems. I am glad NEP has started this journey. The target of NEP should be to put India among the top 10 countries in the PISA index, a measure of the success of the primary and secondary education. I don't know how many of you know, we were 71 out of 72 nations in the PISA index when it was, when the data was released sometime in 2009 or 10. Anyway, it is important to remember that English language had the largest and fastest growing reservoir of knowledge 
in STEM, that is in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. If we forsake English, we will fall further behind in our attempt to use STEM to solve the basic problems of our poor and in our desire to make India prosperous. There are several bottlenecks for our entrepreneurs today. Startup India has done much good work, as I already described, towards making our nation a catalyst for entrepreneurs. Let me add a couple of the most important incentives for the employees of startups that are yet to be suitably addressed and that have the potential to improve the outcomes of Startup India manifold. One of the biggest challenges for an entrepreneur is attracting the best talent from the market to form a team of early adopters. The entrepreneur solves it by sharing the company's equity with these early adopters or by resorting to an attractive scheme for deferred gratification called Employee Stock Option Plan or ESOP. Once the startup has succeeded in the entrepreneurial phase, the next phase is the managerial phase during which the entrepreneur creates a desirable, predictable, and executable sales and profitability trajectory for at least the next five years. This task, as you know, is a must for planning the initial public offer or IPO as it is called. This phase therefore requires hiring a sizable number of managers and technical personnel in various functional areas like sales, finance, production, R&D, HRD, quality, productivity, and technological and physical infrastructure. The startups generally find it difficult to attract such talent since they do not have sufficient uh, financial resources, nor do they have good enough brands to, to compete with the well-established companies. So the startups refer to ESOPs. The good thing about ESOPs is that they generally vest over a period of five years. The ESOP vesting is subject to the awardee achieving the agreed upon targets for the performance during the vesting period of five years. However, the tax authorities tax the ESOP at the time of exercise. I have spoken to hundreds of entrepreneurs and they all tell me that this scheme makes the ESOPs unviable. I do not have time to discuss this in detail due to paucity of time. What is the solution? The solution is to tax the shares arising out of ESOPs, not when they are awarded, not when they are exercised, but only when the awardee sells the shares out of these ESOPs in the open market or to another party. This is what happens in China for both unlisted and listed companies. The employee will have to pay only the capital gains tax, which is much lower than the, the normal income tax at the time of the actual sale. The capital gains tax will be levied on the difference between the sale price and the exercise price. The reward for our government will be many, many fold if the scheme of taxing at the time of selling of shares by the employee is adopted by our government. Let me come quickly to the second important issue. Today, by and large, most venture capital money comes from abroad. There is a small part of VC funding that comes from the family offices of high net worth individuals. There is very little or no money from domestic pension funds, insurance companies, and even from large corporations that have huge cash reserves. It is desirable to create a policy that makes it attractive for these domestic institutions 
to invest in venture capital funding. There are many other suggestions, but I will not spend any more time on those. Having spoken about what the government should do to encourage entrepreneurs, let me now speak a little bit about what entrepreneurs should do to earn the confidence, trust, and respect of our government and our society. Respect from the society is most important for any company since society contributes customers, employees, investors, vendor partners, bureaucrats, regulators, and politicians. Respect from customers enhances repeat business. Respect from employees enhances retention of employees and the ability to attract good quality new employees. Respect from investors attracts more long-term investors. Respect from the government gives confidence to the government to create business-friendly policies and regulations. In other words, the future of the company is safer if our entrepreneurs try to obtain respect from the society. How do our entrepreneurs seek respect from the society? It is by striving to embrace good corporate governance practices and compassionate capitalism. Good corporate governance is about adhering to fairness, transparency, and accountability with every stakeholder of the company in every decision that the owner managers or professional managers take in running their companies. Such practices uh, include asking whether every decision the leaders take enhances the respect for the company. Yeah. Uh, demonstrating leadership by example in fairness, transparency, and accountability in compensation and perks for the senior management vis-a-vis -vis the lowest level employees in the company, fairness and transparency in related party transactions, not acquiring companies at uh, inflated prices by the management while having curbside agreements with the to-be-acquired company and enriching their own personal pockets, eschewing greed, embracing deferred gratification, embracing austerity, contributing a part of the after-tax amount generated by the company for corporate social responsibility activities, and finally, most importantly, ensuring that the sustainability of our planet is safeguarded in every transaction of the company. The violations in following good practices that I have mentioned are not a figment of my imagination. This is what has happened in the last decade in some of the well-known companies. This huge governance, def governance deficits were created by so-called professional managers in well-known Indian listed companies while the independent board members look the other way for unexplainable reasons. My own belief is that good corporate governance depends on the quality of the chairman of the board of the company. Any company where the independent board in general and the chairman in particular are gullible have been brought up without good training in corporate governance practices, lack a sound value system, or in awe of the CEO's glib words, and are fooled by his or her words, has suffered very badly. Finally, how does one operate ethically and seek respect for a company? Folks, it is very simple. Just follow the golden rule. Do unto others what you want them to do unto you. 
Follow that and then everything will be very simple. Second, remember that the softest pillow is a clear conscience. Third, and most importantly, remember that the most valuable and enduring possession for an individual like Mahatma Gandhi showed us is respect from the society and not material wealth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that um, beautiful lecture, very enlightening for all of us. Now, taking the program forward, may I now request Dr. A. Surya Prakash, Vice Chairman, Prime Minister's Museum and Library, who very kindly consented to be present and to chair this program. Uh, I would now like to invite him to please uh, come and give his chair's remarks. Sir. Mr. Narayan Murthy, Dr. Ravi Mishra, members of the T.N. Chaturvedi family who are here, ladies and gentlemen. We have had a very significant thought-provoking lecture from Mr. Narayan Murthy today as part of the T.N. Chaturvedi Memorial Lecture. I have had very happy memories of my association with uh, Chaturvedi Saab. I have interacted with him when he was the Comptroller Auditor General of India, the Governor of Karnataka, and member Raj Sabha. He was an extremely learned and compassionate person, a mentor for many in the administrative service. I have also had the benefit of his advice and encouragement in the course of my work uh, when I was uh, studying, doing a study on the working of parliament and democratic institutions. His report as CAG on the purchase of Bofors guns turned out to be rather explosive and the Rajiv Gandhi government tried to stall the submission of the report in parliament. However, following a leak, the government had to tender the report and this blew the lid on the scandal with the CAG raising serious doubts about the selection process. And then, you know, it had very major political repercussions and uh, uh, the uh, Congress party headed by Mr. Rajiv Gandhi lost that election in 1989. Uh, we are also honored to receive his personal library. It is truly one of the biggest personal libraries of an individual. And we are certain that scholars who visit the Prime Minister's Museum and Library will benefit immensely from the T.N. Chaturvedi collection. Uh, we are fortunate to have Mr. Narayan Murthy here to address us this evening. And um, as you know, he's an extraordinary Indian uh, whose phenomenal achievements in life uh, rest so lightly on his uh, shoulders. Uh, simple living, high thinking is generally regarded as an Indian attribute, um, but you may not uh, find it in Delhi, but it is certainly there in other parts of the country, including Karnataka, the state from which I hail and the state in which Mr. Narayan Murthy was born. And uh, uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy has been showered with many accolades, including the Padma Vibhushan and top honors of France and the UK. In fact, he said in one of his interviews, and he has referred to that in his address today also, that he turned into a compassionate capitalist after having been a confused leftist and communist following his expulsion from Yugoslavia-Bulgarian border in 1974. Um, he has recently said that he worked 85 to 90 hours a week in his early days and when he was setting up his company. In fact, in recent interviews, he has recommended 70 hours a week for all youngsters, nothing less. This has caused anxiety in the corporate world where leisure, five-day week, 
Off-site chilling out is now the norm. But this is good advice in the Modi era because we have a prime minister who sets a punishing pace for himself and for all those who work with him. Mr. Narayan Murthy has seen failures in the early part of his professional life. His first business venture failed. He was rejected for a job by Wipro, which led to the launch of Infosys. Mr. Murthy says, Azim Premji admitted to him years later that that was one of the biggest mistakes he had made in his life. It is truly a great tribute to Mr. Narayan Murthy, and it also tells us uh, the kind of uh, uh, what uh, life uh, teaches us. Failures are actually stepping stones. Uh, so as, uh, as, I, as I said in regard to uh, his uh, early days, and then you know about the whole story about Infosys. Sir, we have heard your lecture with the utmost uh, attention today. A uh, great amount of uh, background and work in regard to poverty alleviation and the status of uh, poor and developing nations and the impact of uh, foreign aid um, and the failure of foreign aid and all that which you have spoken about. And uh, um, he, um, you have also said that uh, motivated leadership is critical to convert aid into valuable assets and provide value for money. This is a very important lecture, in my view, for politicians, uh, bureaucrats, policy makers, and those in the corporate world. Uh, so according to you, the gainful employment and uh, upward social mobility is very critical uh, for us to move up uh, the development ladder and to become a developed nation. And uh, because aid, as you say, creates despondency and dependency. And therefore, charity can be injurious. These are actually very revolutionary ideas uh, in a developing society like ours, where uh, a lot of government funding and this that uh, hinges on um, what are called subsidies. And you've also uh, said uh, that uh, the whole uh, route uh, that one takes in regard to subsidy is not a good idea. Um, only way India can tackle poverty is by creating jobs, encouraging entrepreneurship, and removing obstacles for entrepreneurs. Uh, sir, Mr. Narayan Murthy, thank you very much for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. This is a very important uh, lecture for us. And your advice to entrepreneurs also is very important. Uh, you have told them that they must earn the trust of society and embrace compassionate capitalism and corporate good governance. It lost a, a good list of uh, do's and don'ts are there in your lecture for everybody. I hope um, the, those who have listened to you today and we will have it on the YouTube and I hope a lot of people will listen to your lecture in the future. Thank you very much once again and I want to thank all of you for being here with us this evening and to hear Mr. Narayan Murthy. Thank you. Uh, uh, kindly keep sitting for two minutes. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for giving the chair's remarks. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Avanindranath Chaturvedi to come on the dais and present a shawl to Mr. Narayan Murthy. The family of uh, late Sri Chaturvedi was very keen on uh, honoring him in this manner, sir.
So finally, I would like uh, to thank uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy for his kind presence for the lecture. I thank uh, Vice Chairman PMML, Dr. A. Surya Prakash, for his presence. I thank uh, our director, respected Shri Sanjeev Nandan Sahayaji, for guiding us through this program, as he always does. And I thank all members of the audience, our fellows, and a lot of people who had been associated with late Shri Chaturvedi ji in various capacities. And I must mention that the family of Mr. T. N. Chaturvedi has uh, made an endowment to this institution for conducting this annual memorial lecture. And as I mentioned in the beginning, this is the second such lecture. The first lecture was delivered by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. So we will continue with these lectures in future as well. Uh, please join us for Tea Outside.